An arrest motion for main opposition Democratic Party leader Lee Jae Myung was rejected by the National Assembly. But the DP in shock over the higher than expected number of party members supporting the arrest motion. Another earthquake hit southern Turkey three weeks after the devastating earthquake. At least one dead and more than 100 are injured in this latest quake. An unprecedented exhibition, 185 white porcelain vessels collected during the Joseon dynasty era, unveiled to the public in central Seoul. Good afternoon. The main opposition Democratic Party leader Lee Jae Myung has barely managed to avoid being the subject of an arrest warrant sought by the prosecution over corruption allegations. The arrest motion was rejected by the National Assembly, but the DP is in shock over the higher than expected number of approval votes in general as well as within the party itself. Our Han Sung reports. South Korea's National Assembly, after a considerable delay due to vote counting complications, has rejected the motion seeking parliamentary consent for arresting Democratic Party of Korea Chairman Lee Jae-myung. In an anonymous vote during Monday's plenary session, 139 out of 297 lawmakers present voted for the motion, while 138 voted against. There were also nine abstentions and 11 invalid votes. Two particular votes caused confusion after the assembly couldn't firmly establish whether they were votes against the motion or invalid votes. In the end, after discussions with the ruling People Power Party and the Democratic Party, Speaker of the Assembly Kim Jin-pyo announced that one would be counted as a vote against the motion and the other an invalid vote. Keep quiet, please. The matter has already been discussed with the floor leaders and those supervising the vote count. The Democratic Party holds 169 out of 299 seats in parliament. And while parliament is in session, prosecutors had required by law a majority of registered lawmakers to be present when the motion was put to a vote, and a majority of those lawmakers in attendance to approve it meaning 149 votes for the motion were needed on Monday for it to be passed. The result comes less than two weeks after the prosecution requested an arrest warrant for E on allegations of corruption linked to property development projects launched when he was mayor of Songnam City and third-party bribery involving Songnam Football Club. It was the first time in the nation's constitutional history that prosecutors had sought such a warrant for the sitting leader of a main opposition party. Despite the prosecution failing to win parliamentary consent, it's widely expected they will indict the opposition leader without detaining him or request another arrest warrant after further investigation into other matters. Meanwhile, Monday's meeting also saw legislators pass a government reorganization plan that includes the launch of a new agency under the foreign ministry devoted to consular affairs, dealing specifically with the lives and interests of Koreans overseas. The revision will also see the nation's Ministry of Patriots and Veterans Affairs upgraded to a cabinet-level government body. Han Sung-woo, Arirang News. South Korea believes Seoul and Washington have made substantial progress in terms of extended deterrence against North Korea, some of the two allies have been ramping up lately. Expanded exercise to follow up on recent drills are expected in the near future. Irene reports. The South Korean ambassador to the U.S. Cho Tae-yong on Monday said that Seoul and Washington made practical progress in strengthening extended deterrence, referring to the U.S. using the full range of its military capabilities, including nuclear weapons. Following the 8th Deterrent Security Committee tabletop exercise last week in Washington, which mainly focused on the response to any potential use of nuclear weapons by North Korea, Cho said the two countries will seek to hold follow-up exercises in the very near future. 
highlighting that Seoul's top officials will put more effort into making the North return to dialogue. Cho also mentioned that the North's provocations would only result in international sanctions and further isolation of the North from the global community. Meanwhile, the U.S. Undersecretary of State for International Security and Arms Control, Bonnie Jenkins, also mentioned North Korea's missile launches during the United Nations Disarmament Conference held in Geneva on Monday. She said the string of ballistic missile launches and recent nuclear test preparations by the North cannot be disregarded by international society. On top of that, the U.S. also underscored it has no hostile intent toward the North after Pyongyang warned that Washington's provocations against the regime will be considered a declaration of war. U.S. State Department spokesperson Ned Price said Monday that multiple tests of ICBM, ballistic missiles and other provocative activities by the North have posed a threat to peace and security in the Indo-Pacific. He also reaffirmed Washington's continued commitment to finding diplomatic solutions, saying there is still an opportunity for Pyongyang to engage in talks. Lee Dae-hyun, Arirang News. North Korea is gearing up for a revolution in crop production in the next few years as the regime grapples with worsening food shortages. Pyongyang State Red Media reported on Tuesday that the regime's leader Kim Jong-un decided that the agricultural reform was to be the top agenda of the Workers' Party's key plenary meeting that kicked off on Sunday. State media said that Kim Jong-un projected confidence and was aiming for the successful harvest this year first. However, no details are out on the specific reform measures. Second and the third on the agenda, respectively, were setting economic development guidelines and improving the regime's finances. The finalized agendas will likely be adopted on Tuesday. Another earthquake hit southern Turkey three weeks after the devastating earthquake. At least one dead and more than 100 are injured in this latest quake. Yi has more. Yet another earthquake slammed Turkey on Monday. This time, a magnitude 5.6 earthquake struck the southeastern region of the country, killing one and injuring over 100 others. Authorities say Yesteyurt in Malatya province was the epicenter of the latest quake, an area that has already experienced four earthquakes in the past three weeks, as well as over 10,000 aftershocks. Speaking to local media, Yesoyer's mayor Mehmet Sinar said a number of buildings in the town collapsed, including a four-story building where two people, a father and daughter, were trapped inside. The latest quake comes at a time when the country is still trying to recover from the massive earthquakes on February 6th, which killed tens of thousands of people. Meanwhile, according to a World Bank disaster assessment report released Monday, the cost of earthquake damage in Turkey is estimated to exceed 34 billion U.S. dollars. And that figure is only based on the damage done by the two earthquakes on February 6th. That figure is equivalent to 4 percent of Turkey's 2021 GDP. However, the World Bank assesses that recovery and reconstruction costs will be even bigger, estimating a figure twice that of the cost of damage. Syria's World Bank disaster assessment report was conducted separately and is set to be released on Tuesday. Lee seung Arirang News. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has made a surprise visit to Ukraine, where she vowed continued economic support for the country as it enters the second year of war with Russia. Speaking on Monday, Yellen announced transferring $1.25 billion of aid for areas like schools and hospitals. They'll be part of Washington's latest $9.9 billion aid package. Yellen also said that Treasury Department will prioritize Russia's efforts to evade sanctions. Her trip comes just a week after U.S. President Joe Biden with a surprise visit to Kyiv. The U.N. Human Rights Council has gathered to discuss rights violations around the world, including those linked to Russia's invasion of Ukraine and alleged genocide in China. The body also has some recommendations for South Korea. Ian Jim reports. On Monday, the 52nd regular session of the United Nations Human Rights Council began. The meeting of the 47-member council, which runs until April 4th, is expected to strengthen scrutiny of Moscow's alleged war crimes and raise China's treatment of Muslim Uyghurs. 
In one of the first speeches delivered to open the meeting, UN High Commissioner Volker Türk warned that human rights gains are in danger of being nullified, referring to atrocities reported out of Ukraine as an example of oppression. Much of the progress made over decades is being reined back and even reversed in some parts, most conspicuously for women and girls, the civic space, and the freedoms enjoyed at times of peace and through sustainable development, and the list is long. During the meeting, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said that the Russian invasion of Ukraine had triggered massive rights violations and that in addition to terrible suffering caused by repeated shellings of Ukrainian cities and key infrastructure, dozens of cases of conflict-related sexual violence against men, women and girls had been documented in Ukraine in the last year. The Russian invasion of the Ukraine has triggered the most massive violations of human rights we are living today. It has unleashed widespread deaths, destruction and displacement. Member states are also watching how the UN High Commissioner will refer to China, as Beijing is being accused of genocide against Uyghurs, an ethnic minority in the country, including the alleged mass use of forced labor in internment camps. China has vigorously denied the allegations. Meanwhile, South Korea's National Human Rights Commission reviewed recommendations from the UN body and issued a statement on Monday urging the government to enact a comprehensive law banning discrimination and the abolishment of the death penalty. The UN also recommended that South Korea promote women's rights, protect the rights of groups vulnerable to climate change, and prevent rights abuses arising from advancements in artificial intelligence and information technology. Seoul is required to notify the UN body of its decision to accept or reject the recommendations before the Council convenes an organizational meeting in June. Lee Jin, Arirang News. The number of unsold houses across South Korea last month reached its highest level in more than a decade. According to the Land Ministry, there were more than 75,000 unsold houses in January, a surge of 10.6 percent from the previous month. That's the highest number seen since November 2012. The rise was mostly attributed to the increase in the number of available housing units in the fourth quarter of last year. The government said that it does not yet feel the need to intervene as most of the unsold properties were not in major cities. Data shows that 84 percent of the unsold houses were in provincial areas. After 40 years of dispute, the Korean government has given a conditional go-ahead to build and operate a cable car system over Seoraksan National Park. But the decision has sparked fierce backlash from environmentalists. Chung Woon Ju has more. Plans to open a second cable car line at Seoraksan National Park have been conditionally authorized after more than 40 years of controversy. The Ministry of Environment on Monday gave conditional consent to an environmental impact assessment to build and operate a cable car system over a natural reserve area on Mount Seoraksan. The Environment Ministry's regional office in Wonju said a supplementary report submitted by the Yangyang County government included measures to reduce the project's negative environmental effects. The plan to build a cable car is one of the Yoon seok administration's 15 key regional development tasks for Gangwon Province and was a campaign pledge by Gangwon Province Governor Kim jin -tae. The project, pursued since 1982, seeks to build a 3.5-kilometer-long cable car system between the Seoraksan National Park's Osek area in the county of Yangyang and a spot near the mountain summit. The site is within a state-designated nature reserve as well as a biosphere reserve designated by the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. The plans have been long disputed over its environmental effect and were previously turned down several times because of environmental impact assessments. It's also caused a deep divide between those pushing for regional development and others fighting for environmental conservation. Preservationists argue the region's ecology, including mountain goats, would sustain irreversible damage. The Korea Environment Institute has previously stated that the considerably adverse impact the project will have on the environment renders it inappropriate. 
Environmentalists have also expressed concern that the latest decision may bring on a national park development boom and pledge to protest the plans. Meanwhile, those for development claim the project would provide an economic boost to the local economy. The decision marks the clearance of all administrative hurdles for the project, besides a regional budget review by the Interior Ministry for over 50 billion won. If everything goes as planned, construction will begin next year and the cable car will start operation in 2027. Tong Eunju, Arirang News. Argentina and Paris Saint-Germain star Lionel Messi was crowned the best FIFA Men's Player of the Year on Monday on the back of his World Cup glory. Messi captained Argentina to their third World Cup title, scoring seven goals in Qatar. He has also been an excellent form for his club this season with 17 goals in all competitions. Messi pipped French forwards Kylian Mbappé and Karim Benzema to claim the prize. There were also honors for World Cup winning compatriots Lionel Scaloni, who won Coach of the Year, and Emiliano Martinez, who was named Best Male Goalkeeper. The Best FIFA Awards was launched in 2016 with national team coaches and captains, as well as journalists and fans voting on the winner. Messi previously won the prize in 2019. An unprecedented exhibition, 185 white porcelain vessels collected during the Joseon Dynasty era, unveiled to the public today here in central Seoul. Our Kim jong sil has this story. Joseon Baekja, white porcelain made during the Joseon Dynasty, fills this black room. With the lights showing just the individual vessels, they look like stars in a night sky. A jaw-dropping collection of 31 porcelain vessels, more than half of all the Joseon Dynasty porcelain designated as treasures or national treasures, is under one roof here at the Leo Museum. Those porcelain items were made from the end of the 14th century here in Korea. Joseon Baekja is extremely difficult to make and the material to make the color cost as much as gold. So when they were first made, only the king and members of the royal family were able to possess them. Korean white porcelain from the Joseon dynasty has a harmonious appearance and essence, unlike the fancier vases of other countries. I hope visitors can discover the virtue and value that people during the Joseon dynasty were aiming for. The exhibition consists of four categories. The first section includes this unprecedented collection of porcelain vessels made for king and the royal family, a pinnacle of Joseon white porcelain production. The second section introduces more colorful vessels that became bigger and had unique designs. The third section consists of items from the period of hardship during the invasion from neighboring countries such as Japan and China. During those times, the ingredients to make the blue color weren't easy to import, so porcelain makers in Joseon used iron instead, giving the designs a brown color. Finishing off the collection is the section of pure white porcelain. The exhibition of these prestigious items, which represent the peak of Joseon Baekja, runs until May 28th. The exhibition is free of charge, but visitors must book their spots online two weeks in advance. Kim Jong-sil, Arirang News. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. In the United Kingdom, a new Brexit deal for Northern Ireland has been announced. Following months of private negotiations between the UK and the European Union, a new trade deal called the Windsor Framework was unveiled on Monday local time. This after a meeting between UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and President of the European Commission Ursula von der Leyen. It replaces the much-criticized Northern Ireland Protocol, which was introduced after Brexit in an attempt to avoid a hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. The new framework will see products going from the rest of the UK into Northern Ireland, divided into green and red lanes. The green lane for goods that will remain in Northern Ireland 
will have minimal checks and paperwork. The red lane for goods that could be bound for the Republic of Ireland or the rest of the EU will be subject to normal checks. Meanwhile, Canada has banned TikTok from all government-issued devices as of Tuesday local time. Announced the previous day, the ban means that the app will be removed from the devices and that government employees also won't be able to download the application in the future. The Canadian government says the Chinese-owned short video platform presents a, quote, unacceptable level of risk to privacy and security. TikTok has since expressed its disappointment at the ban, saying that the decision was made without highlighting any specific security concerns. The move follows a similar decision by the European Union to ban the app in official settings last week. Moving over to Turkey now, where thousands of teddy bears rained down onto a football pitch during a match at Istanbul's Vodafone Stadium on Sunday. The plush toys were thrown by spectators and will be donated to children who survived the deadly earthquakes, which struck Turkey and Syria in early February, killing over 50,000 people. Competing clubs Besiktas and Antalya Spor made room for the gesture by stopping the match at 4 minutes and 17 seconds, reflecting the time that the quakes first hit the country at 4.17 a.m. Meanwhile, some spectators directed criticism at the Turkish government over its response to the disaster and brandished signs calling for resignations. And finally, a flower war has broken out in the streets of the Greek fishing town of Galaxidi. The scenes are all part of carnival celebrations that took place on Monday local time. The day saw hundreds of revelers throw brightly colored flower at each other whilst wearing protective goggles and disposable clothes for protection. Called Clean Monday, the annual event marks the end of carnival season and the beginning of the Greek Orthodox Lent. It's said that the tradition began as an act of defiance in the 19th century after Greece's occupiers, the Ottomans, banned carnival celebrations at the time. Matthew Ashley, Arirang News. Good afternoon. Dry spells become more impactful with strong winds in the east of Gangwon-do province today. So we need to stay on high alert against wildfires. In fact, one out of three wildfires reported is caused by hikers. And it will continue to feel like we're going through two seasons in one day. Temperature gaps are wider for southern provinces as sub-zero temperatures this morning reached in the mid to upper teens this afternoon. And especially those in Gyeongju notice temperatures jumping more than 20 degrees Celsius from the cold morning. Now this morning's bad air quality has improved, while well, most areas are under mostly two partly sunny skies this afternoon. Then light rain and snow are in the forecast in the capital region west of Gangwon-do and Jeju tomorrow, but the amount will not be enough to ease the dryness in the air. But tomorrow's precipitation will bring brief cold temperatures on Thursday morning. Then we can expect much more spring-like conditions from Friday. With that in mind, here's a look at the weather conditions around the globe. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great rest of the day.